only one of the finest he's not only one of the finest teachers in endocrinology in the country but he is also one of the finest human being and uh, just knowing sir he is a he is extremely calm composed uh, human being and i think he's you know uh, uh, he just exudes so much wellness uh, that you know we are just privileged to have him today in this uh, talk he is currently the professor and head at the de uh, department of endocrinology at the christian medical college vellore his area of research includes metabolic bone disease which is today's topic and he's also a principal investigator for many multicentral trials in osteoporosis he's a reviewer for many national and international journals including uh, the famous endocrine practice from aace osteoporosis international the indian journal of medical research the indian journal of endocrinology and metabolism and clinical endocrinology he has more than 148 uh, publications in both national and international journals and is also the winner of the pn shah oration at sicon 2017 at the natrajan oration at jericon 2019 and is a member of both the endocrine society of india and the secretary of isbmr and also a member of asia, asia pacific panel of iscd so uh, we are privileged to have sir today and this is going to be a interactive session so we we'll, uh, first you know sir is going to give his deliberation and then after that Uh, we'll open it to all the panelists and all the uh, you know uh, I, i see a lot of young endocrinologists enthusiastic endocrinologists in the uh, crowd today and we all welcome you and this is going to be an academic feast so to over to you sir amit sir okay uh, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction and a very good evening and uh, thanks rosh for this and uh, see next uh, 15 or 20 minutes i just briefly because we all endocrinologists we know what is btm so what is our last we are not used for many years we are used for last 6 years like and uh, we have done in some work so which i'll briefly summarize and uh, of course many of these things we all know so okay so i will just go to i'm just going to share my screen uh, is it visible yes sir yes sir yeah. so once again thank you and uh, uh, i think it is uh, dinner time i won't bore you much and uh, many of these works have been done by my students who are dm trainees so i don't take and also my colleagues and uh, the slide preparation was helped by my colleague nitin and is always there for me to help out with slides now we look at the osteoporosis uh, we know about it throughout india whether it's north east west and all that is varies between 40 to 50% and uh, also in men men are not spared so about 20% above 60 years have osteoporosis so that is known to all of us and this is a article we this is a we published uh, about two months ago uh, looking at the vertebral fractures in our population 400 post postpartum women we found that you know a huge percentage one third of them had at least one moderate vertebral fracture many of them are not aware of it that is a magnitude of problem we are talking about and when you look at the dexa scan this is a wonderful review article uh, written by uh, professor prema and manoj chada and uh, this from the nair group uh, looking at the availability of dexa scan and uh, in, in in india we all know that currently we have about hardly 600 dexa scan so there and this data is as uh, true as per the may 2020 600 scan and people at risk are 150 million people at risk at least so very so we won't be able to like you know many times one dexa is possible sometimes may not be repeat dexa may not be possible in a short time so that is the importance even when we have a dexa sometimes the referral will become an option this we do about 8000 patients per year of course this year was little uh, very less we have done so far only 2000 patients and uh, and we also see, uh, see that optimal sub optimal referral from many departments and also when we are using dexa we always wonder what database to use whether to use uh, uh, mission database caucasian or indian uh, database we looked at it in about uh, one of my students sahana looked at it which we published some time back and we found that mission caucasian database fared better than 
the uh, ICMR database. Now, coming to the proper bone turnover markers, this is my order, and uh, I'll just briefly go through. And now, when you look at it, I'm not going into the so many bone turnover markers, maybe 20 are there, but uh, what is relevant for us in a I'm not talking with relation to the kidney disease. Otherwise, in a normal protein practice, this is usually we do the CTX and the P1NP. CTX as a marker for the bone resorption and the P1NP as a marker for bone formation. They are quite standard and nowadays they are quite robust. So we do find it's very like, you know, they are the bone data markers. Like, you know, we get the feel they are talking to us about the biology of the bone dynamics of the bone that's how we look at it now so we in many of our centers we look forward for these markers that is ctx as well as p1 and p now it's very like it it's not very costly like you know you just you can get it done like uh, maybe about 800 900 rupees you can get the bone both the markers done or if you are focusing only on bone resorption we can get that CTX, otherwise known as beta cross lab done in a, a very easy setting if you have a good lab and good CV. So that, that is the equation we are talking about. They in a bone when we are managing various disorders, including osteoporosis, they come in handy. Now, of course, they come with limitation. There is analytical variability. And if they are in a premenopausal human, they vary with the uh, which phase of the menstrual cycle and also what time of the day, all this are intra and intra individual. At this point of time, we find in our lab, we do a lot. And uh, uh, like, you know, we do about uh, 600 to 600 samples. Uh, when like OPD is busy, we talk about 600 samples per month. Uh, I'll go up to 600 samples per month. And this is the, like, you know, there is ethnicity variations also. So these are all limitations. But having said that, they are very useful still. So now, what about Indian uh, scenario? Now, this is a study uh, done from our center, which we published about few years back uh, in clinical endocrinology. This is the first study to look at the how Indians behave with relation to bone turnover marker. We looked at all bone turnover, most of it. So, but of course, we are focusing on CTX as well as that is beta cross lab and P1NP, and we 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 have got our own cutoff, and we find that. When we compare this cutoff with the Caucasian data, uh, data, our bone turnover is little much, uh, little more, about 20 to 30 percent more, and it didn't equate with vitamin D deficiency also. So we find that our bone turnover is little more than Caucasian. So we use this reference range when we interpret the bone turnover markers for post, uh, post uh, premenopausal as well as the postmenopausal women, and it gels well with the BMD. Like there is a good correlation. Like, you know, uh, if you say uh, resorption, there is a negative correlation. With the formation, there is a positive correlation. The correlation is fairly okay. And uh, it is good, especially with uh, your uh, P1NP and the CTX. Now, when you look at the management, like uh, what exactly we do, so we, this is an article many of us would have come across. Sometime, you no, know, they come with a DEXA scan. They would have, like a young uh, lady would have gone to some center for a back pain and they do a DEXA and you find a Z score of minus three, what to do. Do you all, we all know as endocrinologists, we rule out all the secondary causes we reach. Nowhere. Many times when we have interaction with the KEM, the Dr. Nandi used to say, we, we reached a dead end. So then there, you no, know, it comes the, like, bone turnover markers. So somebody has got a low BMD in a younger age and we are not able to find an obvious cause. We go by bone turnover and we find if there is a markedly high resorption, then we know that we may have to in, uh, treat after correcting the vitamin D deficiency as well as dietary calcium uh, deficiency. If somebody has got a normal range BTM in spite of having a low BMD, then we can watch and wait. That's a dictum we use it, especially in a younger age group. So this is in nutshell, like, you know, for example, somebody has got osteoporosis. This is a nutshell we use in our clinical practice most of the time. So when we use, when you look at the P1NP and CTX, the first scenario, 
both formation and resorption are high like you no know, they are uh, like they are not low at least so the resorption we are talking about 500 600 range bone formation that p1 np in some 60 70 range then we are very comfortable to start with uh, uh, bisphosphonate alendronate or soldonic acid or resendronate after correcting dietary vitamin d uh, dietary calcium and vitamin d deficiency just opposite of that sometimes we do find resorption in a very really low range like you know the 200 ctx in 200 but the formation is also low then it is preferable to not to use uh, bisphosphonate you should converse for teriparatide whereas another scenario is sometimes you get a less formation and more resorption that is a common sense that we use anabolic therapy that is teriparatide of course abeloparatide is not available followed by anti resorptive this is a rough guideline we follow when we are managing osteoporosis after menopause and osteoporosis in elderly men this is a lady very interesting she's about 46 47 now i i think all, all of you should focus on p1 np and ctx her main problem was she's losing height she was 160 plus and she lost height her skirts are sweeping the floor that's how she noticed that she lost significant height when she came to us she has had received soldronic acid and at the time height was 150 she had lost about 10 to 12 cm before that then we looked at the beta cross lab and uh, this thing that is ctx and p1 np they were low so we were dealing with a lady who has significant osteoporosis not attained menopause we couldn't find a secondary cause and we have to deal because she is losing height and she is saying that in spite of bisphosphonate she is losing height so this is equation but if you look at the bone turnover they are in a low turnover stage because patient has received two doses of soldonic acid now what we we all know that we can start teriparatide what we saw was she is from kerala and she came after 5 months 7 months one thing if you notice that at 12 months the both resorption and formation have gone up at, uh, then what we notice is patient is gaining bone at the same time patient is losing bone and she say she has lost further 2 cm in last one year 148 now then we thought we have to block it so we continue teriparatide and we added denisumab to it then now she came for a follow up after the lockdown now she last one year she didn't lose any height so this is where no dual therapy we can do based on this bone turnover markers so where we gave denisumab plus teriparatide and we can see that the result is good now we are going to continue we, are, we, are, we cannot give any more teriparatide we are giving only denisumab and to see how things are moving now this is another lady uh, typical like you know uh, what indian setting we are talking about 58 year lady coolis fracture so there is some osteoporosis in the past and she was diagnosed with osteoporosis elsewhere based on a lunar dexa scan and we look for uh, secondary causes obvious uh, secondary causes of course she is menopausal she is not a she was not having diabetes she was we started on bisphosphonate she our first preference is iv bisphosphonate but they are not willing we go for oral bisphosphonate either alendronate or resendronate or ibadronate after correcting calcium and vitamin d we have a follow up so now the question is when do you stop it so 58 years old post menopausal for 9 years and fastest year so this is a, this is a ctx that the bone resorption when she came to us in 200 2014 this is when we started doing this uh, bone turnover in a trial basis one of my pg was doing dm trainee was doing thesis that time look at the beta cross lab bone resorption is more then we are starting alendronate and you look at that uh, i am not put the in between values in 2016 after like you know one and a half years to two years it has become suppressed now the question is whether to continue or not can we stop it what exactly we did was that's exactly we did alendronate we stopped and we the thought we'll follow it up now this is the bmd do you look at it when we started and it improved and we see in 2016 it reached like you know it's a good bmd almost 7 to 8% it is more than lsc and it is maintaining up to 2019 so this is exactly so each patient behavior like it's not like you have to give 5 years of bisphosphonate no 
Now we have got 41 patients with single dose soldronic acid finding that the BMD is going up. That's what we are going to publish it with Osteoporosis International. The first data from the country, 41 patients, single dose soldronic acid, the BMD is improving. We are not repeated. Like, no, we have not uh, given the repeat dose because the standard dictum we say is uh, like, you know, uh, you keep three doses. No, may not be needed for all patients because if the bone turnover is suppressed, then there is no need to repeat it. Now, the so this is what we use, you know, every three to six months, we can look at a beta cross lab. After one to two years, we can even giving, we can give drug holiday at that time itself when the bone turnover is suppressed. Now, what about other, these are all, many of these conditions as endocrinologists we see and we practice and we manage. Now, this is one case we managed sometime back, many years back, and a 58 year old lady, she had a, treated with the bandronate just for 18 months and she had a fracture low threshold fracture no low turnover state fracture now this is what we all know right side it is cracked the cortices are thick left side is going to is beaking it's going to impending fracture so we know that it is bisphosphonate induced fracture this patient was fixed there was no secondary other cause then we gave teriparatide now we have so far, eight, this is the data up to 2018. We have got four more cases, 12. We find that you know, the bone turnovers are very useful, including our total alkaline phosphatase. We find it very useful. Uh, like, you know, this, uh, the one finding we find somebody on bisphosphonate, if they say low back pain, especially on bisphosphonate, we shouldn't ignore it. We should do x ray pelvis and femur to see whether there is a track sitting there. That, we failed initially, even last year we failed. We ignored it, patient fractured and came. So the message here is somebody on bisphosphonate, even at one and a half, two years, complain of some big, especially sometimes diabetes, we will think of uh, diabetic neuropathy or myralgia may not be. Please, we will do a X-ray pelvis and see whether the cortices are thickened. Then we should stop it. The another cruel, crude method we find is, uh, this is what? Even define our alkaline phosphatase when it drops below 60, then we should know that uh, it's a total. I'm not talking about BSAP. Uh, if you find somebody who started on bisphosphonate and it is above, above 80 and it is coming down below 60, be cautious. You can even, if it reaches below 50, please stop it. And CTX in all these patients, we found that to a less than 300 microgram. So it gives you a clue that the, the bone has gone to a frozen state. So this is where we can use on utility to prevent. And the thigh pain is very important. We learned lesson almost out of most of the patients had this prodrome pain. In many cases, we missed it. This is a very simple case. Spine pages we had and uh, ruled out all the metastases. It's a very straightforward case. Uh, so now why I put it is, you can see this uh, arrow, alkaline phosphate itself telling the story. Alkaline phosphate 222 in 2017. We are giving alkaline phosphate, uh, sorry, soldronic acid. In 2018, it is dropped. You look at the bone resorption in 2018, and we see the serial bone resorption markers and formation. Though it is high, it is dropping after giving soldronic acid. It's a very straightforward, not like, you know, we see they are fall in line with alkaline phosphatase, but sometimes it may not be. I will show you the next case. This is a young lady when uh, my postgraduate presented in ISBMR in PGI Chandigarh. Dr. Uh, Anil Bansali was saying, oh, so the age is 33. So we had a biopsy that time. Stuart Ralston was also there. He's a one person who is interested in pages. We, so we presented this case and he was saying one of the youngest. So then this lady coming to us in a bone pain. I look at in the first thing. CTX, very high resorption, 1,448. Alkaline phosphatase is also elevated. Our upper cutoff is 125. P1NP, both, it's a high turnover going on and bone scan is looking as like, you know, it's look at like, you know, uh, it is skull and all that taken. We are given soldronic acid. After that, the biopsy proven brains. Look at in October 15, this lady was supposed to come in December, never turned back, with the severe symptoms, severe symptoms. October 2015, patient has got a symptom. Look at alkaline phosphatase. It is not shining, whereas the CTX is still elevated and P1NP is still elevated. So then 
what we did was we gave a second dose of uh, uh, soldronic acid. After that, you can see the next scan in March 2016. It's completely in remission. So this lady came in 2018 also. She's in a complete remission, though she has got some osteoarthritic pain. So sometimes the alkaline phosphatase may not match. Then, you know, with the clinical symptom, there the CTX can be used uh, uh, to further facilitate your therapy. This is another interesting case. And uh, this lady came from uh, central Tamil Nadu. She has got McEwen and Bright. Very, very difficult. Initially, she came with the pelvic pain and all that she had. And she had received 300 milligram of solendronic acid, 60 doses of solendronic acid. Every month she used to get in one right. And also, it was like, you know, so symptomatic. And received only 9,000 mil, 9, milligram. It is a huge dose and no relief. She gets relief for 10 days, 15 days. So we are wondering what to do. She has come and she had a, all the futures. This time she had a headache, though in the initial was back pain. Now, this is an initial bone scan. She came in 2019 and uh, she had a, you can see the uptake. She had a polyosteotic, a fibrous dysplasia. She had a precocious puberty. She was short and also she had a deformed skull. All this, uh, make you, uh, what is it, cathelia spots right there. And we gave, this time we thought we will try tenisumab. We gave 120 milligram of tenisumab uh, in uh, August. Then she came. Uh, I will show you the BTMs and shows the uh, in May she had come in the lockdown period. Uh, then you can see there is an improvement in the uh, thing, uh, improvement. Though we were not happy when we looked at the bone turnover. Now she has come, she has got a significant worsening. The Densimab has worked for some time. I will show you the bone turnover markers. Like, you know, you can see in, uh, in the, like, in the earlier 2019, it was 1,274, that is CTX. After giving Denisumab, it is coming, it is come down to 134, then it is building up. When she came in May 2020, though she was symptom, asymptomatic, but we found that it was climbing. We wanted to give Denisumab, but she refused. But look at the alkaline phosphatase. It was showing a significant normal trend. It did not show. But now she has come with worsening. Then we, we have given one more shot of, uh, uh, we have given one more shot of uh, Denisumab, 120 milligram now. So this is where there is, can be a dissociation between alkaline phosphatase and other BTM, where you can rely more on BTM. So I like to conclude the, we know that postmenopausal women will have a higher BTM and we, we can trust it and uh, it goes in parallel with the BMD and we can use in the, not for diagnosis, for management of the patients. And also when we find predominantly bone resorption is more, we can go for bisphosphonate, but somebody has got a low formation, better to start with teriparatide if the patient can afford. And sometimes when we are giving teriparatide and the patient is still has a bone loss, then we can give a dual therapy based on the BTMs. So it's very, and also we can use, these are two ones we, we, which I told, we discussed P1, NP and CTX. And uh, we can also, for atypical fracture, we can look at this. It's not that three years, four years drug all day. We stop, and that's what we, uh, our latest paper is on 41 subjects, single dose of sodronic acid, and we are following them for three years. We had uh, like you no know, significant uh, good results in the BMD, no vertebral fracture increase, and also we found that no peripheral fractures also. So we may not, Indians may not need three or four years of continuous. We can look at BTM and you can stop early. Thank you very much for this. Sir, uh, thank you so much for this. I think it was a wonderful talk. I think a lot of things were, uh, you know, uh, very practically, uh, you know, approached. And I think, you know, the, some of these clinical pearls would be really useful in clinical practice. Uh, so just a question on, uh, since, you know, uh, that was the topic which was touched the last, I'll, I'll just ask a question on that. Uh, we talked about, uh, you know, McCune Albright uh, and fibrous dysplasia and the use of denosumab and, uh, you know, uh, 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 using bone turnover markers as a monitoring. In fact, we recently had a patient with, uh, you know, uh, McEwen Albright where we did consider, we did give uh, denosumab. She had 
uh, you know, multiple issues against all internet given for a long time. Uh, so one of the issues is that, uh, you know, these patients also tend to have hypophosphatemia uh, potentially. And so how do we, you know, uh, even uh, we uh, dug up some case reports and we found that sometimes, you know, giving both bisphosphonate and denosumab sometimes can precipitate, uh, uh, you know, uh, a worsening of the hypophosphate, uh, hypophosphatemia. And uh, there's a case report, uh, you know, uh, which has also shown that, uh, you know, abruptly stopping denosumab sometimes leads to recalcitrant uh, hypercalcemia uh, as, a, as a sort of, you know, uh, 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 you know, after stopping the drug. So any experiences with that uh, in terms of McEwen Albright and, and how do we really uh, monitor the phosphate or, or should we really replenish the phosphate and calcium before we, uh, you know, uh, consider giving denosumab? Yeah, it's an excellent question, Noam. Um, uh, thing is, uh, to be honest, in McEwen Albright, uh, we did not, I, I see our experience is limited with hypophosphatemia, but we have found in other clinical setting after giving denosumab for that matter, with uh, even uh, soldonic acid, we have found both hypocalcemia, hypophosphatemia, hypomagnesemia, and sometimes hypokalemia also, we have found. So uh, in McEwen Albright, I, sorry, I won't be able to comment, I am, I am not sure. But what we usually do in a, uh, in a clinical setting, when, that's the reason we found that when we want to give high dose of tenisumab, for example, 120, especially in this kind of settings, we'll make sure that uh, we load them with lots of calcium, at least 1,500 milligram of calcium, and as well as the your cholecalciferol, not even 20 nanogram cutoff. We go up to 13 nanogram. Our Indian guidelines is we say 20, but not here. Regarding phosphate, we do, we had patients, hematology patients, we are having this problem. We okay. replace phosphate with along with that, because uh, uh, along with the denisumab. Hypocalcemia also, we found a very significant hypocalcemia, especially in hematology patients, but I have not, uh, not treated somebody with McKinney Albright where they had a hypophosphatemia. I, I, my, okay. this thing is very limited. Sure, sir. Uh, sir, we have a question from the audience. Uh, yes. And we talked about drug holiday. And I think it's yes. a it's a wonderful use of using bone donor markers. And what you, you said about, you know, uh, perhaps Indian patients requiring a, you know, a single dose of Zolendronate. I think it's a path breaking idea. Uh, the question here is, that, uh, sir, what uh, cutoffs would you consider, uh, you know, sure. even NP and CTX uh, when, while you're dealing with, a, a, you know, a drug holiday? Excellent. So uh, what we have done, this uh, 41 subjects which we, we are submitted to Osteoporosis International. Now, uh, there is, it's not a, our, I, like, you know, there have been previous study from Australian group, especially Mark Boland from New Zealand, as well as uh, this man, what's a read. They already looked at this single dose, what's happening. See, I equate this uh, bisphosphonate to our statin. Because Westerners, they use lots of uh, high dose of statin. We, we know in our diabetic clinical, diabetes clinical practice, we use 10 milligrams. Still, we get away with uh, HDL less than 70 milligram. Similarly, we find this. So that regarding cutoff, we, are, we, we have an absolute cutoff. You want to say CTX less than 150, less than 150 we take and uh, P1NP less than 30. This is by practice. That's what we are defining in our article also. Uh, CTX less than 150. For example, somebody had a 600 uh, CTX, that is the nanogram, uh, sorry, picogram. And uh, when we give soldronic acid or bisphosphonate, it has dropped below 150. You see a value of 120. You can stop it and follow it up after six months. Then you can restart. And in fact, this is the same thing they pra practice in entry Ford. This is the same. Thing they practice in Kentucky. I think we should also look at it. Why do you want to blindly give this? Uh, Dr. Shruti, uh, uh, you know, is, is one of the, uh, you know, a very brilliant endocrinologist from Ahmedabad. Uh, and ma'am, uh, she has a question. Ma'am, would you like to ask the question to sir? Directly? Yes, uh, sir. Uh, good evening. Actually, uh, yeah, yeah. you might remember me. We interacted yes, regarding yes. one know, previous patient. Yes. So, uh, actually, sir, uh, the patient transplant recipients, especially who are on chronic glucocorticoids, then mm -hmm. where do we place this bone turnover markers in their uh, management? Yeah. So, you, uh, especially post transplant, we have data, very limited data on renal transplant, but we have a lot good data on liver transplant and bone marrow transplant. Uh, 
the liver transplant the advantage is it is not malignancy and uh, bone marrow transplant we have a data on managing this uh, osteoporosis in non malignant conditions like aplastic anemia so what we usually offer if the turnover is high we all know that when we they get a suppression the first six months is going to be the maximum bone loss as i as 20 to 20 to 25% so we usually if facilities or like you know if the first option if it is non malignant we go for anabolic therapy so that we gain the bone especially younger individuals and then followed by a uh, anti resorptive therapy at the same time when i find a ctx of 1000 or 1500 then i still give bisphosphonate because uh, we can suppress the res uh, resorption and get the bone back so it also depends on how much bone formation the bone formation is also high and resorption is also high i will go for anti resorptive otherwise my option is non malignant condition try for anabolic therapy even in post transplant setting okay okay Okay. Uh, so I, mean, one, I don't know uh, whether I answered the question. I don't know whether I'm answered the question. No, uh, I mean, uh, no, it, I mean, uh, it is. Uh, it was quite clear, sir. But I mean, when should we start advising bone turnover markers if such patients are referred to us? So should we have it at baseline and keep on doing it? That's exactly what we are doing for all transplant okay. patients. We have three transplants. One is hematology transplant. We have a liver transplant, and we have a kidney transplant. we are doing but the problem with kidney transplant we have not got dsip bone specific alkaline fall we are just getting it so we are storing sample okay. we are not we our experience is very limited in renal transplant okay. but the other transplants yes we are published in uh, the same hematology in a uh, american journal of hematology our experience with the bone turnover especially on tbs also in the post transplant patients okay okay uh so one practical question uh so we we talked about uh, pre analytical uh, variabilities in in uh, you know using these markers uh, yes. so uh, how do we you know if we want to send a sample for a bone turnover markers uh, you know uh, does it need to be in fasting what are the other precautions that need to be taken is is the circadian rhythm and the timing of the sample important so yes. can you just uh, share some thoughts on that yeah so it's like it is always preferable if possible food interferes so the though know, it can go it's a bi bidirectional it can go it can increase it or decrease it but the problem here is uh, so what we usually do we should do fasting and timing is also important we usually stick to eight like a, i relate bone turnover marker as a 8 am cortisol or 9 am cortisol so we do between 8 to 9 am and also we say preferably in a fasting state because food interferes it can go by direction we are seeing both the directions so it is uh, yes a very good question actually good 8 to 9 am is sir okay uh, dr vivek uh, would you like to ask a question sir uh, uh, good evening sir uh, sir there are two yes. questions sir. one is the extension of uh, dr ohm's question then uh, when we are using this uh, uh, bone turnover markers in a pre menopausal woman Yes. So any any particular time of uh, menstruation that we prefer to uh, pass this uh, yes. bone turn bone turn yeah there is no hard and fast rule but the like you know if you look at the Sheffield group Richard Easter who has written the guidelines when he came we asked the same question he came for a ISBM R 2015 to Velo we asked he prefers follicular phase okay follicular phase okay okay and sir uh, the another question when Uh, we are discussing about the stop based phosphonate by using uh, uh, the results of bone turnover markers mm. can you use the same bone turnover mark for uh, deciding when we start this phosphonate during the drug uh, while we are monitoring the bone turnover marker we are following the bone bone turnover markers uh, can we decide that at what particular time we can restart this phosphonate or whether a particular time when we yeah, have yeah, to yeah. add any other, another therapy so yes. any, any 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 cut off value for that yeah, also have, yeah, yeah yeah so i told you what when we stop the bisphosphonate in uh, like you know what we have followed as a this thing is uh, less than 150 for an indian subject less than 150 so if i find somebody to be 140 or 130 
and i am following up every 6 months i cannot do ultimately of course i cannot do a bmd every 6 months it's a yes. it's not possible but i can do at least once a year and when i find the bone turnover marker reaches at least three times of the last value it has gone in like an above 300 then i am know that bone has woken up bone has woken up from the frozen state so many times we find that after 2 years or 3 years we find that this values are bouncing to 360 380 then i will also look at vfa vertebral fractures whether this fellow had a any any this lady had a any extra vertebral fracture two we i also look at a bmd any the bmd decrement has been more than 3% no if both are not there i will wait but when a value i see above 400 then i am very safe to restart this phosphate hope i answered the question yes sir thank, thank you sir. less than 150 and 2.5 times that's what we take it as a rough cut up and then above 400 we we know that bone is active we can restart this phosphate and i always we make it a point we lost last week we had a patient it was a repeat all repeat 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 like that it was ibandronite that lady had a atypical fracture this lady had a back pain and when i looked at uh, her uh, x ray pelvis one year back 2019 shows cortices are thicken i should have stopped there then no it never came to me as so the patient had a atypical fracture so my in addition to bone turnover i prefer like you know that is out of experience i am telling 3 years and all that if somebody complains some back pain please do x ray pelvis it's not costly you do cortices thicken stop it and alkaline phosphate is below 50 we find it the bone has gone into total i am not talking about psap so there's a again a question from the audience and very interesting question uh, we know that in diabetes patients you know the uh, uh, dexas are not very reliable uh, yes. so do we have any data of using yes. uh, bone yes. turnover markers yes. effectively yes. in diabetes patients yeah. yeah our article has been accepted for diabetes of course one of my postgraduate is presenting in isbmr just it is getting into this acceptance mode the reviewers are happy with the comments we looked at type 2 diabetes uh, 200 subjects and 200 controls and uh, we looked at all the parameters we looked at tbs we looked at bmd we looked at hip structure analysis we looked at vertebral fractures all this takes are the right parameters and we found see i i started this talk and by saying it throughout india whether it is delhi or whether it is from varanasi or from tamil nadu or kerala it's 40% but in diabetic subjects is only 28% have the same the bmd is falsely high especially in type 2 where i found this tbs micro architectural deterioration has been found in about 52% vertebral fractures were seen in 32% so i fully agree with you bmd and also bone turnover we did bone turnover is also low turnover compared to the controls age and bmi match non diabetic controls post menopausal women 198 women were there so we found that uh, uh, it was uh, turnover in diabetics was low both formation and resorption was low significantly and we looked at hip structural that buckling ratio also very high in diabetic subjects right okay. so thank you so much sir uh, uh, dr shrikant uh, yes uh, do you have a question yeah, yes sir same so so uh, with the extension of same uh, answer that you said sir so you have uh, matlab uh, like you suggest some some uh, cut off for the btms in diabetes patients which would uh, yeah we that, I, that would actually we are not reached that stage but we take okay, this yes, cut off sir. we are not reached yes, that stage no but uh, of course we should be less because we are starting with the low many diabetic subjects we are finding it's all to start with itself is hovering around 280 320 not like your non diabetic where we find 400 500 cts we are starting so but we don't have a definite uh, different cut off for them so <laughs> 
sir also uh, sir like uh, uh, patients coming us to our for for other than osteoporosis and and we counsel them uh, sir this is i am in a private practice uh, in ahmedabad yes, yes, so we, yes. we we counsel them for uh, for getting bmd or what is osteoporosis but they are like uh, most of them not, never do and uh, get a bmd done so sir can we use uh, the bone turbo nover markers first we get a btm done and if it is uh, elevated and then explain them ki yes the btms are elevated and and uh, then uh, ask them to get a bmd done sir so what to take so i'm yes, not sir. but at that as per the guideline that is not the that is not that is aiding in your uh, like you know management not for the like you know going for the texa so because that is one real time thing so may not be like you know you cannot substantiate by looking at a btm and say i turn over please do for example if you find a i turnover like a, you see a ctx of 800 and you find a t score of minus 1 so what are you going to do like no it's not that so in that setting what we usually do here now we we have got our frax cut off which we published in uh, uh, archives about 4 months ago one of my pg did so we redefine the cut off based on the frax without bmd then we we initiating treatment in a rural tribal area we go there do frax without bmd and look at the cut off and we initiate treatment for them so i will do frax and then make a decision rather than go by btm thanks thanks yeah thank you sir thank thank you. Uh, so dr mohan had a question uh, on chronic liver disease so is there any difference in uh, bone turnover markers in cld patients who are uh, uh, yeah and can okay. we utilize yeah yeah that is another abstract which is going to be presented in my dm training uh, in this isbmr we looked at uh, different types of uh, liver disease we looked at uh, here we we are going to present only the hepatitis b liver disease cryptogenic cirrhosis liver disease and controls so the we find that uh, the people with the cryptogenic cirrhosis has got markedly elevated uh, resorption compared to the people uh hepatitis b on tenofovir treatment because the hepatitis b inflammation is controlled so we find that we finding in liver disease what secondary to cryptogenic cryptogenicity we find a high turnover whereas the other two hepatitis b on treatment and normal controls add a normal or little low turnover that's what, that is our we had a very small number we didn't have a very big number So, we, but it was the homogeneous group. Uh, uh, we have Sir Dr. Hirain Pat, uh, who is an endocrinologist from Ahmedabad. Uh, yeah. Dr. Hirain, do you have a question for Sir? Yeah, yeah. Uh, good evening, Sir. Good evening, uh, Sir. Uh, just want to know about your experience um, uh, as far as bone turnover markers is concerned in CKD MBD. Uh, yeah. So that's exactly I told. See, we are just stored sample. We have like you know. now we have about 62 patients we have finished uh, uh, 62 patients we have finished about 18 months follow up we have stored up the sample for bsap and uh, we have done ctx but we know that ctx is not reliable and also b1 np is also not reliable so if you in nutshell uh, our experience is limited but we have stored sample for this 62 trans pre transplant and 6 uh, months following transplant 12 months following transplant 8 18 months out of the 62 4 hours have come four died only 58 we have but we are not analyzed or we don't have that psap we are requesting biochemistry to get that uh, so one of the issues with uh, uh, yeah hiran you had a question sorry follow up question no no oh, oh. Yeah. yes yes shikan sir uh... Sir, um, if we um, like, if even if uh, so, what kits you would suggest for for P one MP and CTX? Like, if we ask yeah, our local uh, kits, uh, you would uh, say for uh, P one MP and and for CTX, the kits that sir uh, you use? Yeah, we we use the Roche only for from the our reference range onwards. We are using okay. that one. We are not okay. changed it. So it's a okay. any platform and it's a Roche. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can anyone from Roche tell us about you know where we can get these tests done in Ahmedabad? Uh, which are the labs which are currently doing it? Uh, yes, yeah, sir. Uh, so this is Divya. Uh, 
yeah, so this, these instruments are actually available in all the major labs, uh, whether we say Metropolis, SRL, you have Green Cross, you have Supratech, all of these labs are actually having the instrument in. And, uh, and on that same immunology in, instru instrument, these uh, tests can be performed in. So the availability of testing will not be a concern. So you just need the okay. kits and the you know relevant kits. Uh, the platform is available in most labs. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Most of the hospitals and labs have it. Okay. Thank you. So just just uh, we'll just bother you for a couple of questions more. Uh, I, I'm sure you know you have been so graceful on uh, you know answering all of our queries. Uh, uh, just uh, uh, you know one of the issues with periperitides, sir, is is you know compliance of the patients. Uh, and, you know, uh, we don't know because it's a daily injection. We're not very sure whether the patient is really taking it all the time, uh, you know, uh, whether there is a skipping of doses and so on. Uh, you know, something like an insulin, you would be able to monitor the blood sugar. So can we use bone turnover markers to really check the compliance of our patients on teriparatide? Actually, it's very important, like, you know, so what we find is uh, with the teriparatide, the, the, within three months, if you do, like, for example, I'll tell one number, P1NP to start with 60. And if the patient has been fairly complained and the P1NP after three months, it will be more than 300. It's very high, 10 times it will go high, as early as three months. So your question is very valid because this is exactly, you can look at it whether the patient has taken it down. We caught the patient out. So like, but at the same time, you know that, uh, PGI study for an Indian setting, if they take four days a week also, it should work well. That's what uh, the ultimate, like, you know, like if you ask Sanjay and uh, like, you no, know, so it's at least four days a week, I'm happy. But this goes up 200, 300, like that it goes up very high. Okay. Uh Yeah. So uh, anyone from the audience wants to directly ask, we just, we have a few more minutes. Uh, uh, you know, uh, can we ask a few more questions if anybody has? Yeah, so I think uh, we have, uh, you know, I'll just ask you so one more question. I think uh, we can then wrap it up. Uh, uh, somebody has asked in hyperthyroidism, and we know that there is, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, a bone involvement in hyperthyroidism as well. Uh, do we again have any kind of experience with use of yes. uh, BTMs in hyperthyroid yes. patients? Yes, and, yeah. yes. Kripa has presented in ASICON 2018. Uh, 18 or 17. This is in Trandram. When I did the oration, Kripa's, uh, this thing was, uh, Kripa is my uh, associate professor now. She was uh, doing DM. Her data was on Graves' disease. We had about uh, 60, 65 patients and 65 controls. And uh, we have two data. One is like a baseline as well as follow-up data. We found that uh, there was a markedly, like, you know, the, when the yeah, free T4 was more than three or four, you see one CTH value of 1,300, 1,400 and all that. And the same thing applicable to hyperparathyroidism, which we are publishing next month in endocrine practice, our two-year follow-up. So there also we find this CTH is going to 5,000 and all that, 4,000. Like, but they are crashing after curative parathyroidectomy within three months to some like you know, 100, 200 like that. So in hyperparathyroidism, we find initially a high turnover state, especially CTX goes up to about 1,000. Above 1,000. And once we treat, we have six monthly data only, but we don't have like, no, it's a lot, three monthly data. So how early, we are not sure. Great. Uh, I think so. Thank you so much. Uh, sure. And, uh, you know, any last words or comments from any, uh, from you know, from the panelists or the audience? You want to add anything? Uh, Vivek, you want to add anything? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir, for it. Uh, for your time and uh, excellent talk and the uh, queries which um, all the uh, uh, attendees were having even our queries has been resolved very much by your own work that is the uh, the beauty of your talk that for every every question you have data available with you and that is the best part that we have uh, our own indian setup of data Dr. Vivek, we have some strange data also. Our uh, colleague sitting there, Dr. Sandeep Agrawal, presented on yes, motor, neuron, motor neuron disease and bone. He has published it. 
motor neuron disease and bone so first sir, study sir, thank you sir thank you sir this was your, all your blessings and thank, thank you very much lecture, i really sir. enjoyed it i don't know whether i cleared this is our experience i'm really privileged to see such a brilliant mind when i spoke to dr mithal that's what he said you are going to face a brilliant crowd so that's what i had thank you very much sir thank, thank you so much sir thank you sir, sir. Thank you, sir thank for you so the much, excellent thank lecture thank you so much sir for excellent thank you. so much sir thank you so much lastly you. Um, i would like to um, give a thanks uh, to the organizers that is uh, dr om and his team and a very big thanks to dr thomas paul so you are a stalwart in the field and as uh, dr vivek just acknowledged that you have data points for everything uh, and i really uh, I, i can see that the crowd enjoyed the interaction immensely um, and i also believe that you know uh, with so much data available uh, and the paucity of dexa also the limitations of dexa as to uh, uh, the the uh, you know the information it gives and the time at which it gives vtms becomes very very important for monitoring of treatment as also you mentioned in the end to check for compliance to therapy then also the decision to start treatment which treatment to give at what point of time to change over the treatment the drug holiday i guess vtms are immensely useful for so many things in osteoporosis treatment as well as the others and uh, so so thanks a lot for this great talk uh, i hope everybody enjoyed i would i have a last request to everybody to switch on their videos uh, and we can have a group snap so we cannot have a group snap as we have in face to face meetings but at least on uh, zoom for our memory sana will you be able to take it yeah sure smile everybody here we go yeah thank yeah. you thank you thanks a lot so thank you, thank you sir uh, for you know this i think it was really wonderful and uh, thank you to all uh, the uh, attendees and all the panelists especially Uh, uh, Dr. Vivek, Dr. Hiren, Dr. Shruti, and Dr. Shrikant, and they've been always, you know, very supportive of these uh, programs. And I think, you know, uh, uh, I hope it was a great learning experience for all. Uh, we are having a, another interesting session on Sunday uh, on thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer, uh, and you know, it would be a panel discussion, something like this, very interactive. So I hope all of you can join us on Sunday at 11 o'clock for uh, the same. We'll be sharing the details in the groups very soon. So thank you all, and thank you to Rosh for making this possible. And I think you know, uh, 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 perhaps you know, uh, there's a blessing in disguise for Corona because now we are able to have a lot of live webinar sessions with uh, uh, great stalwarts like Dr. Thomas Paul, sir. Uh, you know, and I think you know this is really wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, and have a good night. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.